discovered millions of tons of frozen water on the moon, locked in the ground at the poles. One site is in an area near the South Pole known as the Aitken Basin. It's part of the moon which the sun never strikes. That has allowed the ice to remain close to the temperature of outer space rather than being boiled away by the sun's heat. The announcement is being made at the moment at a news conference in California. It's likely to mean that the cost and complexity of building a permanent base on the moon can be greatly reduced. I'm joined now from the news conference at NASA by our correspondent Leo Enright. Leo, what are they announcing? Well, Anna, this is to many space scientists the holy grail of, si of scientific exploration of the moon, the discovery of very large quantities of water at the north and south poles of the moon, less than some scientists expected according to the measurements they've made today. Uh, but still very large quantities. It would cost something like $60,000 million to launch that much water to the moon if you had to bring it yourself. Let me show you. This is the historic signature of water on the moon, just released to us by the American Space Agency in the past two minutes. Well, Leo, with that amount of water on the moon, could it sustain life? Well, certainly there's no prospect of life on the moon as far as anyone can establish at the moment. But uh, clearly what this would provide is an opportunity uh, to build lunar bases uh, and to use the water to fuel the rocket ships of the future that could be used to explore the solar system. This is an important development. It doesn't uh, change man's future and woman's future entirely, but it does open up the prospect of rapid exploration. And apart from water, Leo, have they found anything else during this exploration? Well, this satellite is called the Lunar Prospector. It is searching for resources on the moon that could be used here on Earth and also uh, used by explorers on the moon and to explore further into the solar system. The announcements today will include other important discoveries and the press conference is just about to begin. Leo Enright, thank you very much indeed. And the presence of water on the moon was first suspected after photographs taken by a satellite in 1994 were examined. It led to the current Lunar Prospector mission, NASA's first to the moon since the manned flights in the 1970s. The discovery of water on the moon could transform the agenda for space exploration. NASA may well start to rethink its missions to distant planets, and it could resurrect the idea of a permanent colony on the moon. The first clue there might be water on the moon came four years ago when another satellite spotted what could be ice at the bottom of a crater near the South Pole. The sun never shines there, so it never evaporated. It's thought it was dumped there millions of years ago by a comet. To confirm the discovery, NASA launched this satellite, the Lunar Prospector, last January. It's now orbiting the moon over the poles, scanning the surface, searching for signs of water. When the astronauts explored the moon in the early 70s, they landed at six sites near the equator. When scientists examined the rocks which the astronauts brought back, they found no hint of water. Only in the cold of the polar regions is there water, locked up beneath the surface, waiting to be exploited. Just the idea of water captures the public's imagination. You think of water, you think there might possibly be life. And even if there's, we're not talking about, obviously, life on the moon, but it raises the possibility of going to the moon and living there in a more comfortable and less inconvenient way. If humans did colonise the moon, they could use the water to drink and they could make oxygen from it to breathe. They could even make hydrogen and oxygen rocket fuel from it. Launching rockets from the moon would, in theory, be a very good way of exploring space. The moon has one-sixth the gravity of Earth so it's easier to leave the gravitational pull of the moon and of course there's no atmosphere either so again leaving the moon's surface is that much easier than leaving the earth's surface so you can even use exotic types of launchers such as uh, electromagnetic launchers use the sunlight to generate electricity wind up your electromagnets and then just shoot yourself up into space when NASA claimed its scientists had found tiny fossils in a Martian meteorite its reputation soared more recent research has cast doubt on that claim. Now NASA may be hoping that finding water on the moon will once again galvanize enthusiasm for its space program. But the International Space Station is already stretching tight budgets. A moon colony is likely to be way in the future. James Wilkinson, BBC News. And full coverage of NASA's press conference is now being shown live on the BBC News website. 
People making, making calls to mobile Spectrometers, the neutron spectrometer, the gamma ray spectrometer, and the alpha particle spectrometer. And in the fourth chair, we have Scott Hubbard, the NASA mission manager for Lunar Prospector, a co-investigator on the mission, and the deputy director of space here at NASA's Ames Research Center. Now that you've met our panel, let me turn the floor over first to Dr. Alan Binder, who will begin with a summary of Lunar Prospector spacecraft performance, science goals, and an overview of mission science accomplishments to date. Dr. Binder. Thank you, David. First of all, I too would like to thank you all for coming. Uh, I've been very pleased over the last several weeks to hear all the phone calls from the press asking how we're doing and, of course, being very curious about the results that uh, we were seeking. I'm sorry that we've had to hold off a little while, but I will tell you we did not know the answer to the questions until just about a week ago. So you're hearing the news as fast as we've been able to get it out. As David already mentioned, we launched Lunar Prospector just shy of two months ago. It'll be two months tomorrow. Uh, it took us about nine days to get to the moon, get settled down into the mapping orbit. So we just right now have about seven weeks of orbital data. The things that we will be discussing today are based on just the first one month's data. And I think you all know we've got uh, 17 more months of data coming in, and so these are preliminary results. In the case of the gravity mapping, of course, we do have uh, final results. In the case of the search for water, we have what are preliminary results because there's a lot more data to come in. But nevertheless, what I will tell you very shortly uh, is very positive. The mission itself has been going splendidly. The spacecraft, as I've mentioned many times, uh, is a gem to fly. Uh, this has been a great experience, both being in on the building of it and, of course, flying the spacecraft to the moon and now keeping it uh, doing its job. Uh, it performs absolutely as we expected. Actually, that's not true. It's performing much better than we could have hoped. This is just a little gem. We are getting ready for our first orbital maintenance burn, which we will do Saturday night at 8 o'clock in the pre- mission planning, I had assumed we'd have to do a burn about every month, and we now know because of the gravity mapping that that's not the case. We only have to do a burn about every two months. So we are doing extremely well in our fuel budget. I'm slightly ahead of the game, and there's plenty of fuel to do the nominal mission without question, and to do the low altitude mapping during the extended mission, which will start about 10 months from now. So spacecraft-wise, we have a great mission going. Scientifically, it's beyond even that. Today, we're going to talk about the results from the neutron spectrometer and the gravity experiment, but I do want to mention the, a little bit about the gamma ray, the alpha particle spectrometer, the mag, and the ER. The data from these experiments is, again, beyond our expectations. In fact, I would like to say that when I proposed Lunar Prospector, I promised NASA a certain level of quality of data. As we began developing the spacecraft and the instruments, we went back to headquarters, Scott and I, and said, well, we think it's at least a factor of two or three better than that. And that's an underestimate. The data now are a factor of two or three better than we even promised headquarters just a few months ago. Clearly, I'm extremely pleased about this. The data we're not going to talk about today, of course, take longer to analyze and to collect, but just very briefly, uh, the, for example, the gamma ray data, when you simply hold up the raw spectra, you can see the differences between the Mari and the highlands in terms of their thorium content, their iron content, etc. So the data set is really exquisite, and I promise you that over the next year we will have results which will make a tremendous impact on our understanding of the moon. Coming to the topic of today, as I think you already probably know from the handouts, we will be presenting the first operational gravity model of the moon. This is extremely necessary because we did not know how much fuel to put on the spacecraft before this mission. I had planned for a certain budget, which we are holding very nicely, but because of the uncertainties of the model, I had tripled the amount of fuel necessary, or as we thought was necessary, for the mapping mission. That extra fuel, of course, I can use for my extended mission, but for the first time, not only our mission, but follow-on missions can be planned properly, and the fuel load can be calculated very accurately, and so you don't have to build quite as big a spacecraft. We will be looking forward to scientific results in terms of understanding the nature of the crust, the crustal structure, the deep interior of the moon from these data. As you all know, 
prospector to go back a little bit is picking up the mapping that was started during the Apollo era by Apollos 15, 16, and 17. At that time, NASA flew very similar experiments. Some of these are basically the, the, four, uh, the, the fathers of the experiments we're flying and mapped about 20% of the moon, getting critical data on the gravity, on the magnetic fields, on the composition of the moon. We've picked up that baton and are, are obviously mapping the entire moon. We have the first complete maps in terms of gamma ray mapping, neutron mapping, etc. These data will help us understand the origin evolution of the moon and of course its resources. As I've mentioned many times, Lunar Prospector by its name is looking for resources which can be used for future manned activities. The second thing that we are going to discuss today is a search for water, and we have found water. We have the first unquestionable results indicating that there are significant quantities of water at both lunar poles. Uh, the, it appears quite firmly that there's about twice as much water at the North Pole. I should say water ice. I want to be very careful here. We're talking about ice. About twice as much water ice at the, in the North Polar regions as in the South Polar regions. The level of understanding we have right now is as follows. We are certain that there is water there. We gi are giving a very rough estimate of the quantity of water in that this, no one has ever seen neutron spectra before. This is the first time this technique has ever been applied to the moon. And of course, when we started getting the data back, it was different than we had theoretically uh, calculated. Basically, we had expected the information about the water to come from the very slow neutrons, the very low energy ones, and the intermediate range neutrons. It turns out that the best information is from the high energy and the intermediate neutrons, and so we had to completely redo our modeling, uh, which is incomplete, by the way, and so the numbers that we will give you today have to be viewed as preliminary. The results are correct. There is water, and the amount of water in a cubic yard or cubic meter of, of lunar soil is small. We think it's on the order of 1% perhaps smaller, perhaps a little larger. Those things we're quite certain of. But the actual numbers in terms of how many metric tons of water, et cetera, are going to have to wait until we get done with A, collecting more data, obviously, and B, until we understand this completely new field of neutron spectroscopy. The amount of water and the impact uh, are two areas of interest. One, we think we are seeing something on the order of between 10 million tons to a few hundred million tons uh, of water. That's a significant quantity. Uh, if you picked up a cubic yard of the soil in the, in the cold areas at the pole, you might find as much as one, two, maybe five gallons of water per cubic yard. This is not a lot, but nevertheless, it is a significant amount. If our estimates are correct right now that we are dealing with, let's say, 100 uh, million metric tons, that's equivalent to a lake about two miles on a side, four square miles, and about 35 feet deep. Uh, so that's a lot of water. The implications, of course, are tremendous. For the first time when we go to another planetary body, as we did in Apollo, you can fuel up. As I think most of you know, Water can be decomposed into hydrogen and oxygen, which is the main propellant for the shuttle main engines. And as you all know, the big tank uh, that's strapped on the side of the shuttle uh, is filled with liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen, which is the best chemical fuel. So we can go to the moon and use this water as a propellant to go between the Earth and the moon, which will make manned uh, activities on the moon much less expensive. It's an enabling factor. That's the word we like to use. This will make it much easier to do this. And of course, that fuel can be also used to go on to Mars and elsewhere in the solar system. So this is a tremendous uh, resource that we can use in the exploration of space. So that's where we stand right now. Uh, the details of both of these experiments will be discussed by my co-investigators, Alex and Bill. And at this point, I would like to turn it over to Alex. Good morning. Uh, we have a new gravity model for the moon. It's uh, a buildup of... Listening also to that uh, news conference and joining us now from NASA's Research Center in San Francisco is our correspondent, Leo Enright. Uh, Leo, uh, Dr. Binder talked uh, many times about preliminary results. 
How sure do you think they are that the evidence of this uh, large lake-sized quantity of water is unequivocal? Oh, they're pretty certain. This is the historic first uh, printout, as it were, of the information which came back from the moon. It's the water signature chart, uh, and it quite clearly shows very significant quantities of water uh, buried in with the soil at both the North and the South Pole. And one of the big surprises today is the discovery that, in fact, there may be more, more, more water at the North Pole of the moon than there is at the South. Is there any uh, reason why that should be the case? Well, no, I must admit that I'm somewhat puzzled because uh, originally we assumed that the huge quantities that were being speculated about uh, and are still being talked about uh, might reside in the so-called Aitken Basin, a huge impact crater on the south pole of the moon, which was only discovered in recent years. Uh, it seems, however, uh, from the results of this lunar prospector, that the water ice is more widely distributed, uh, apparently inside craters which are permanently shadowed uh, by the, uh, the crater rim. So it would appear that even relatively small craters uh, at the north pole of the moon are also in permanent shadow. And uh, as we were saying here earlier in the studio, uh, these uh, quantities of water ice have been brought, as it were, to the moon by comet activity. Is that correct? Oh, yes. I mean, this is scientifically, I think, one of the most exciting aspects of this. Uh, the discovery of water ice doesn't help us much in our understanding of the history of the moon, because, as you say, this stuff came to the moon uh, on comets. But what it does offer, in addition to all of the great advantages Al Binder was talking about, it, it offers us the opportunity for finding in situ all the debris collected by the moon over billions of years uh, and giving us a, a history of the development of the solar system uh, through the study of water ice. Uh, Dr. Binder was uh, talking about, uh, obviously, about the big implications, the historic implications of, of all this. And he talked about water as providing uh, the fuel uh, for rockets, but it's, it's a big leap, isn't it, from, from uh, finding water ice to converting it into water fuel, into rocket Not fuel. Not particularly. Not no. particularly, <laughs> believe it or not. I mean, basically what Al Binder is saying is that if you put a, a large mechanical digger on the moon, the sort of thing you could see uh, a telephone company using outside your front door, uh, every scoop that it dug up uh, would contain five to eight gallons of water. Now, that's a lot of water, and uh, each of these scoops, as it were, could be distilled very easily into the constituents of water, hydrogen and oxygen, which are themselves the main fuels used for the exploration of outer space. So this transforms our understanding of the moon and, and makes the moon a fueling station on the way to the planets. Just a, a final uh, note of possible skepticism, Leo. It's not so long ago that uh, scientists were talking about primitive life forms on Mars from fossilized evidence, and yet that came later on uh, very much to be challenged by other scientists. Is there any remaining degree of skepticism in order today? I, I think nothing on the scale that we saw uh, after the announcement about the, the Allen Hills meteorite. That was always a very controversial call uh, by a team of respected scientists. Uh, and in a way that was taken away from the scientific community, uh, almost, dare I say it, hijacked for political purposes. Uh, there has been, I think, some embarrassment in the scientific community uh, that they ran to judgment without peer review, the thing that is so important in science. They've gone this time also without peer review. Uh, but I think there is a general acceptance uh, that the signature for water uh, seen in these instruments uh, is probably correct. Uh, and indeed, there are many in the scientific community here that I've spoken to in recent days who believe the estimates we've heard in the last few minutes are very much on the low side and there could be billions of tons of water ice on the moon. Leo Enright, fascinating stuff. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. And with me once again now here in the studio is David Wade. He's a lecturer in space vehicle design at Kingston University just outside London. First of all, David, uh, Dr. Alan Binder, talking about Lunar Prospector, referred to it as a little gem uh, which has been performing even better than they expected or hoped that it would. Let's just take a look at this uh, amazing machine and ask you a few questions about it, if I may. Mm -hmm. uh, there it is going I in orbit. It, it, it's an orbiter, not a lander. Is That's that right? right? It orbits at a, a height of about 60 kilometers from, from the surface. And as it's traveling over the surface, it's, 
It's looking for particles. There you can see a, a what simulation are these, what are these of the these colored particles. things coming up? What, what it is, radio radioactive particles striking the moon's surface are dislodging electrons from, from, the, from the surface, from the actual minerals and the water that is now proved to be there. And that, and that activity would be going on even if the, that's, the perspective that's going wasn't on all there the at time. all? That's going on all it's the time. It's just picking up that activity. Yeah, from background radiation which exists in the, in the universe. And then those radioactive particles coming back up, or those, those uh, active particles coming back up into orbit are actually detected by the spacecraft's instruments. And in some way, uh, the instruments analyze this data. That's right. They, they look at the actual energy level of the particles and then convert that energy level and the actual position in the spectrum uh, that that energy level is in uh, to, to a, a particular mineral, in this case, water. Now, uh, we were talking with Leo, uh, obviously, about uh, the implications of all that. And Leo was excited about it. Dr. Binder was excited about it. And Leo said, if you get this excavator thing that you might see a telephone company operating outside your house, this could be the beginning of converting uh, water into rocket fuel. Is it, is it really as simple as that? But most of the technology is there. The, the big problem at the moment is the funding to support that technology is not there. Um, certainly, it, it, it is nice and easy to, to think of, say, a, an excavator uh, digging out this, 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 uh, this rock and, and actually crushing it down into, into, the, uh, into the components that you need. But you've also got to consider the power. You can't run a diesel engine or a petrol engine on the moon. It would have to be powered by solar power, so you'd need large solar arrays to actually collect that power and then generate it or, or actually channel it to, to the digger as well. So the technology is more or less there, but on this scale, it's, it's still a little... In way. other words, okay, you might save a lot of money by not having to, to transport the water to the moon, but there's an awful lot of other stuff you've got to get there uh, to make it work. There is an awful lot of other stuff. However, in the longer term, it, it's got tremendous benefits. Uh, it, it really could pay off for future exploration of the universe, as, as Leo said, as a, as a fuel stop, basically, on the, on, the rest of, on the way to the rest of the solar system. Just finally, does today's announcement and today's discovery tell us anything at all about the prospect of life existing somewhere else in space? It, it shows that water certainly exists elsewhere in the universe, and if there's water and a breathable atmosphere, then possibilities of life are certainly increased. Uh, possibilities of life probably not on the moon, probably not. Uh, there's never an atmosphere on the moon. Uh, the moon's gravity is too weak for that. Um, but elsewhere in the universe, with comets hitting other planets, then certainly there is the possibility. David Wade, thanks again very Thank much you. indeed.